Welcome to Review Central. This is DCAT reviewer number 9, featuring questions for the DCAT mathematics subtest. This reviewer is intended for those who are eyeing, or are set to take, the De La Salle College Admission Test or DCAT. There are 10 questions featured on this reviewer. All questions are modeled on actual questions that appeared on previous DCATs. Before we proceed, don't forget to subscribe to Review Central and click or press the bell button to make sure you get notified whenever we post a new reviewer or other review materials on this channel. Now let's begin. Question number one. Which of the following is a tautology? Before we proceed to answer this question, we need to know what a tautology is. A tautology is something that is true in all circumstances. Let's examine answer choice A by tabulating all of its possible outcomes. We have already done the tabulating for you, as shown. A is not the correct answer since not all its possible outcomes are true and therefore, it is not a tautology. Answer choice B, P and false, will always result to a false outcome so it is not a tautology either. Let's proceed to examine answer choice C by tabulating all of its possible outcomes. Again, we've done the tabulating for you, as shown. As you can see, C results to mostly false outcomes so it is not a tautology as well. For answer choice D, PR true will always be true. However, since there exists a negation symbol, then the statement will always be false and cannot be a tautology. Now we are left with answer choice E. But is it in fact, a tautology? We need to inspect and tabulate all its possible outcomes to establish if E is indeed a tautology. Again, we already tabulated the outcomes for you. As you can see, all the possible outcomes are true. It is therefore a tautology, and the correct answer we are looking for. Question number 2. Which of the following is equivalent to, logarithm base x, of the quantity, the fifth root of a squared times b, over 2 cd cubed? a, 2 fifths times the logarithm base x of a b, minus 3 times the logarithm base x of 2 cd. b, 1 fifth times the quantity, logarithm base x of a squared b, minus logarithm base x of 2 cd cubed. c, 2 fifths times the logarithm base x of a, plus 1 fifth times the logarithm base x of b, minus the logarithm base x of c, minus 3 times the logarithm base x of d, minus the logarithm base x of 2. d, 10 times the logarithm base x of a, plus 5 times the logarithm base x of b, minus the logarithm base x of c, minus 3 times the logarithm base x of d, minus the logarithm base x of 2. e, 2 fifths times the logarithm base x of a, plus 1 fifth times the logarithm base x of b, minus the logarithm base x of c, plus 3 times the logarithm base x of d, plus the logarithm base x of 2. The correct answer is c. Problems involving logarithms can be quite intimidating. But it's all a matter of knowing your logarithmic identities. If you have familiarized yourself with, or better yet even memorized your logarithmic identities, then the solution will come to you naturally and you will be surprised how short and simple they'll end up to be. For this particular logarithmic problem, the first step is to rewrite the given logarithmic expression using the various logarithmic identities or relationships. First, we know from our logarithmic identities that logarithm of x over y is equivalent to logarithm of x minus logarithm of y. Therefore, we can rewrite the given expression as logarithm base x of the fifth root of a squared b minus the logarithm base x of 2 cd cubed. Next, the logarithm of the y root of x can be rewritten as logarithm of x raised to 1 over y and the logarithm of xy can be rewritten as the logarithm of x plus the logarithm of y. 
Therefore, we can rewrite the first term as logarithm base x of a raised to 2 fifths, plus logarithm base x of b raised to 1 fifth. Similar to the previous logarithmic identity, where the logarithm of xy is equal to logarithm of x plus logarithm of y, the logarithm of xyz is equal to the logarithm of x, plus the logarithm of y, plus the logarithm of z. Therefore, we can rewrite the second term as logarithm base x of 2, plus logarithm base x of z, plus logarithm base x of d cubed. Next, the logarithm of x raised to y can be rewritten as y logarithm of x. Therefore we can rewrite the logarithm base x of a raised to 2 fifths, as 2 fifths logarithm base x of a. The logarithm base x of b raised to 1 fifth, as 1 fifth logarithm base x of b. And the logarithm base x of d cubed, as 3 logarithm base x of d. We then distribute the minus sign to the rest of the expressions. The only remaining step is simply to rearrange the terms. And you'll be delighted to find out that the expression we arrived at is exactly as the one in answer choice C. Question number 3. The formula to calculate the future value of the annuity at the end of the investment is as shown. Where? Fe is the future value of the annuity stream to be paid in the future. R is the amount of each annuity payment. And I is the interest rate per period. Which of the following is the formula for the amount of each annuity payment? A. R is equal to the quantity I times FB minus 1, over the quantity 1 plus I raised to N. B. R is equal to I times FB over the quantity 1 plus I raised to N. C. R is equal to I times FB over the quantity 1 plus I raised to N, minus 1. D. R is equal to I times FB over the quantity 1 plus I raised to N, plus 1. E. R is equal to the quantity I times FB plus 1, over the quantity 1 plus I raised to N. The correct answer is C. The formula for the amount of each annuity payment is R is equal to I times FB over the quantity 1 plus I raised to N, minus 1. The solution to this problem is actually a lot easier than it seems. Although the given formula is one that is used in business finance, the problem itself can be simply solved using basic algebra. To arrive at the formula for R, we simply express the given future value formula in terms of R. With a few steps of algebraic transpositions, we should quickly arrive at the formula for the amount of each annuity payment, R. Question number 4. The graph of, function of x equals kx raised to 5, plus 15x raised to 4, minus 2x, minus 10, passes through the point minus 1 and 4. What is the value of k? a minus 4. b minus 2. c minus 1. d 3. e 5. The correct answer is d 3. Since the graph of the function of x passes through the point minus 1 and 4, we can use the values of x and y, which are minus 1 and 4 respectively, in the equation. Step 1, let's substitute x equals minus 1 to the given equation. Step 2, equating the function x to y, we can replace function of minus 1 with a value of y which is 4. Now we can proceed to solve for the value of k. We should arrive at k equals 3. Question number 5. An investor earned an interest of 31,250 pesos from his investment in the local cooperative's lending program over the last five years. If the investment pays 2.5% simple interest annually, how much did the investor put in the lending program? A. 200,000 pesos. B. 250,000 pesos. C. 300,000 pesos. D. 350,000 pesos. E. 400,000 pesos. The correct answer is B. 250,000 pesos. Recall your formula for simple interest. Interest earned, I, equals the principal or amount invested, P, times the interest rate, R, times the time, T, in years, the amount is invested. Interest earned, 
i.e. is given as 31,250 pesos. The interest rate, r, is 2.5%, and the time or length of investment, t, is 5 years. We need to compute for the principal, b, which is what the investor put in the lending program. Substituting the given values into the formula, we have 31,250 equals p times 0.025 times 5. We should easily compute p to be 250,000 pesos. Question number 6. What method of proof is illustrated below? Proposition. Suppose n is an integer. If 7x plus 9 is even, then x is odd. Proof. Suppose x is not odd. Thus, x is even, so x equals 2a for some integer a. Then 7x plus 9 equals 7 times 2a plus 9 equals 14a plus 8 plus 1 equals 2 times the quantity 7a plus 4 plus 1. Therefore, 7x plus 9 is not even. Your answer choices are A. Proof by contradiction B. Proof by contraposition C. Proof by cases D. By direct proof E. By constructive proof The correct answer is B. Proof of contraposition Proof of contraposition is formed by negating both terms and reversing the direction of inference. In our given question, it is propositioned that if 7x plus 9 is even, then x is odd. By using proof of contraposition, it is supposed that x is not odd, so 7x plus 9 must be not even. Question number 7. Perform the following operations, as shown. Your answer choices are A. 4 over the quantity x plus 4 B. The quantity x minus 2 over the quantity x plus 4 C. 4 over the quantity x minus 2 D, the quantity x plus 4, over 4. E, 4 times the quantity x minus 2, over the quantity x plus 4. The correct answer is A, 4 divided by the quantity x plus 4. This is another basic algebra problem. This one involves division of polynomials and fractions. Step 1 is to switch the numerator and denominator of the divisor, and then change the operation sign from division to multiplication. Step 2, simplify all the factorable expressions, and then cancel out similar terms. We should quickly arrive at the correct answer, 4 over the quantity x plus 4. Question number 8. Solve for x in the equation, 12x times the quantity x minus 1 equals 4x plus 3. A, minus 4 thirds and minus 1 half. B, 1 over 6 and 3. C, minus 2 and 3 fourths. D, minus 1 half and 2 thirds. E, minus 1 over 6 and 3 halves. This is another basic algebra problem. Let's solve it quickly. Step 1, distribute the quantity x minus 1 on the left side of the equation. Step 2, simplify. The resulting equation should be a quadratic equation. Express it in standard quadratic equation form. Step 3, factor the quadratic equation. The result should be, the quantity 6x plus 1, times the quantity 2x minus 3, is equal to 0. Equate both factors to 0. Let's start with 6x plus 1. 6x plus 1 equals 0. 6x equals minus 1. x equals minus 1 over 6. This is the first solution. Checking the answer choices, we can see that only choice E has negative 1 over 6 so this should be the correct answer. Nevertheless, we should always validate our answer, so let's proceed to equate the second factor to 0. 2x minus 3 equals 0. 2x equals 3. x equals 3 over 2. Again, checking on the answer choices, we can see that indeed 3 halves is the second solution and answer choice E. This validates, without any doubt, that E is the correct answer. 
Question number nine. When Basilio was six, his brother Crispin was half his age. Now Basilio is 70. How old is Crispin? A. 12. B. 35. C. 50. D. 67. E. 73. For the solution to this, let's introduce you to a handy technique when solving these problems. Tabulate with the names of the people whose ages are being compared as rows, and the known or given points in time, usually the present or now, some point in time in the past, and some time in the future, as columns. Let's show this using the solution to the above example. Step 1. Set up your age table. This can be a simple sketch with your pen and paper when you are in your exam. Step 2. Let X be the age of Crispin now. We usually assign X to the age we are looking for, in this case Crispin's. In the case of Basilio, his present age is given as 70. There is no need for the future column in this case since there is no reference to either Basilio or Crispin's age in the future. We can simply ignore this column, or indicate not applicable as shown. This is actually a very simple age problem, but it tends to confuse a lot of people because of the half his age phrase. At one point in time, when Basilio was 6, Crispin was half his age. But that is the one and only point in time that that is true. The only useful information we can derive from that statement is the difference of their ages, which is 3. Their age difference is what does not change over time. Basilio will always and forever be 3 years older than Crispin. Step 3, therefore, to find Crispin's present age, given Basilio's present age, is simply to subtract their age difference, that is, 3, from Basilio's present age. Crispin's age now, is equal to Basilio's age now, minus their age difference. By simply picking out the figures from our handy age problem table, we write the equation for Crispin's age now to be equals 70 minus 3. Therefore, Crispin's age now is 67. Question number 10. If I feel energized and motivated, then I will study general mathematics. I feel energized and motivated. Therefore, I will study general mathematics. What rule of inference does the argument follow? A. Simplification. B. Modus ponens. C. Modus tollens. D. Disjunctive syllogism. E. Hypothetical syllogism. The correct answer is B. Modus ponens. Modus ponens is the rule of logic stating that if a conditional statement, that is, if P then Q, is accepted, and the antecedent P holds, then the consequent Q may be inferred. You have just completed DCAT reviewer number 9, which featured questions for the DCAT mathematics subtest. If you wish to watch more DCAT reviewers for the DCAT Mathematics subtest, check out our DCAT Mathematics Reviewers playlist. Check out also our other DCAT playlists for other reviewer topics. If you haven't done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe to Review Central and click or press the bell button to make sure you get notified whenever we post a new reviewer or other review materials on this channel. Please like if you find this video useful, and feel free to share it to anyone who may also benefit from it. We wish you all the best on your forthcoming DCAT, and we look forward to your exciting days as a Lazalian. Animal LaSalle.